Good afternoon, everyone. If I could have your attention, please. Uh, welcome to the Every Other Month Riley um, Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics lecture series. We try to do this as an ethics grand rounds, and every other one of them we have here at Riley with a focus of a pediatric topic for ethical considerations. My name is Brian Leland, and I'm a pediatric critical care physician here at Riley, and I also direct the Medical Ethics Fellowship at the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Um, I did want everyone to know that the lecture today is being recorded and it's being live broadcasted. So we appreciate IU North, IU Ball, the IU School of Dentistry, IU Reed, IUJ, and St. Vincent for participating. And if I left someone out, I apologize, but I think I had everybody. Um, thank you all for being here and for your dedication to furthering your ethics education. If you would all do us a favor and silence any electronic devices that you have or put them on vibrate, and if you do need to return a page or answer a phone call, if you'd be so kind as to step out um, as to not interrupt the presentation, I'd appreciate that. I want to say before uh, I introduce our speaker that uh, our speaker, Dr. Shavastava, has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, so, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker, who also happens to be a dear friend of mine, Dr. Nan Srivastava, who completed a pediatric residency here at IU. And I have to tell you that our intern year, the very first month of intern year, we were on the same call schedule with uh, Dr. Rachel Yoder, and we affectionately called ourselves the Dream Team, uh, which speaks to our humbleness. <laughs> she also was a chief resident here and completed a cardiology fellowship just in the last year or two. And in 2017, participated and graduated in the clinical ethics fellowship over at the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Her project focused on pediatric patients and surrogate decision making, particularly for children with complex congenital heart disease. Um, she currently practices over at Eskenazi as a pediatrician and a clinical ethicist. So please help me welcome Nan. Thank you and good afternoon to all of you. Today we'll be talking about the ethical appropriateness of offering comfort care in new diagnosis hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And we'll do that by identifying the ethical principles that guide parental decision making in the context of an uncertain prognosis. And we'll describe factors that affect how clinicians provide counseling in new diagnosis hypoplastic left heart. Given the current data regarding the outcomes and potential long-term implications, we'll talk about if it's still ethically appropriate to discuss comfort care as an option, or if we should focus our attention more on the newer interventions and modalities. Dr. Leland mentioned I have no, disclosure, no disclosures to share. So today we'll um, talk briefly about um, hypoplastic left heart or HLHS and what the current state of treatment and prognosis is. Then we'll turn our attention more from an ethics discussion to um, the parental decision-making process and how clinicians counsel, and then wrap up with um, recommendations from an ethics perspective, as well as some discussion and questions. So hypoplastic left heart syndrome affects less than 1,000 babies born annually in the United States. And although it's a minority of heart disease, it is considered one of the most severe forms of con complex congenital heart disease. And let me show you um, what this uh, cardiac lesion entails. In the normal heart, 
the deoxygenated blood or the blue blood comes back to the right side of the heart. It's pumped out to the lungs where it picks up oxygen. That blood comes back to the left side of the heart, which is shown in red on this diagram. The left ventricle is the main pumping chamber, and it pumps that oxygenated blood out across a valve and into the body where it delivers oxygen to the head and neck and then to the rest of the body. However, in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the left side of the heart is too small. In a simplistic way, it is underdeveloped. The valves are too small between the top and bottom chambers, as well as the valve between the pumping chamber and the heart, and the pumping chamber itself is too small. Immediately after birth, these babies can survive because they have a remnant of their fetal circulation, which is called the ductus arteriosus. And this blood vessel allows blood from the blue side to cross over to the red side and get to the body. However, once this vessel closes, which is usually within the first 24 to 48 hours, the child can become very sick since they don't have enough blood going to their body. We're still learning about the genetic underpinnings of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. From what we know so far, it's a heterogeneous condition, and it can occur sporadically or run in families. Approximately 25% of patients with HLHS also have an associated genetic disorder, such as Turner syndrome, whole arm syndrome, or trisomy 13, 18, 21. And these genetic syndromes can add complications to the patient's prognosis because there may be other extra cardiac anomalies. Until about 30 or 40 years ago, hypoplastic left heart syndrome was almost universally fatal. 15% of babies with this condition died on the first day of life, 70% died within the first week, and over 90% didn't make it past one month of age. Surgical techniques have become available, and they can help to reestablish blood flow from the body to the lungs and back to the body. We call these palliative techniques because they're not curative, they don't fix the root of the problem, but they give us a long-term solution. So, We'll be talking about what are the ethics of continuing to offer comfort care as an option now that we have some other choices available. The current state of hypoplastic left heart treatment, um, there are primarily three pathways to discuss. The first one is comfort care, and sometimes we call this palliative care. What this means is giving comfort measures to minimize suffering for the patient, but acknowledging that the end result, if there is no intervention to address the root problem would be death of the child. The next one is heart transplant. This one is a, a limited by availability of organs since you rely on a donor to give a heart. And the graft survival is about 15 to 20 years, which means that after that time, the child would need another heart transplant. The final option is what we call the um, palliative surgical approach or the Fontan uh, approach. And here, we're gonna reroute the blood flow and then do stepwise repair to get to a functional um, circulation. So this is a diagram that I have taken from one of our Riley doctors, Dr. Yabrodi's uh, paper from 2016. And I'll show you kind of the overview of um, the three-stage repair. In the first stage, and this is uh, primarily what we do here at Riley, this is the Norwood procedure. We reroute the blood flow using a temporary connection here to allow some blood flow to the lungs. A new aorta is made here by reconstructing the pulmonary artery, and thereby the right ventricle becomes the main pumping chamber. And if you recall, in a normal heart, the left ventricle should be the main pumping chamber to the body. Because of the extensive reconstruction that's needed, as well as the delicate hemodynamics of the heart and of the neonate, this is a very challenging operation. Around six months of age, the child, who's hopefully bigger and stronger, um, can undergo the next of the series of repairs. And in this one, part of the blue blood that returns from the body is, is attached to the pulmonary artery here, allowing some passive blood flow of blue blood to the lungs but some of the blue blood that's coming back from the body is still mixing in with the right side of the heart along with the red blood coming back from the lungs. So therefore, the third part of this procedure is to connect 
all of the blue blood, hopefully, back to the lungs, and then separate the blue blood coming from the body from the red blood coming back from the lungs. So these are stages one, two, and three, or Norwood, Hemifontan, and Fontan, as we do here at Riley. And then hopefully stage four is a happy, healthy patient with a great quality of life. It's difficult to know what the outcomes will be for all patients. And um, part of this is because this is overall a very rare condition. And we're still learning what factors affect the outcome that any given patient will have. We do know that all children have a very tenuous status between stage one and stage two. On average, the mortality between the Norwood and the Hemifontan or the second stage is about 10%. And sometimes it's unexpected. There have been programs put into place, including an extensive home monitoring system that has helped to decrease this rate over time. There's also the potential need for other interventions, such as additional surgery or catheter-directed therapies. As I mentioned, the mortality between stage one and stage two is about 10%. And what's been reported in the literature typically ranges from 88 to 92%. However, some centers have reported that their most severe variants have had survival rates as low as 26%. Between stage two and stage three, when the child is bigger and stronger, the survival rate improves to about 95% across the board. The Mayo Clinic did a review of over 1,000 of their patients who underwent the Fontan completion, so the third stage of those procedures that we talked about. And I should note here that not all of these patients had hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Some of them had other variations of congenital heart disease that had just one ventricle. But in this study, they found that the survival after 10 years was about 74%, after 20 years was 61%, and after 30 years was 43%. And part of that number surely reflects that surgical techniques and therapies have improved over time. And part of it reflects complications related to chronic heart failure, other organ failure, and um, primarily in this study, protein losing enteropathy, which is one of the known complications of the Fontan. Other long-term complications include diseases of other organ systems, including the lungs, arrhythmias, Babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, even in utero, show evidence of abnormal brain development, and there may be complications related to this over time. These children may have increased risk of neurodevelopmental delay, sensory neural hearing loss, feeding and growing difficulties, and then we've also seen an increased incidence in psychiatric disorders, primarily in anxiety and ADHD. There's some new data looking at uh, psychosocial complications of hypoplastic left heart and its effect on the family unit. So all parents of children with complex heart disease report increased levels of stress. However, in patients of children with HLHS, as compared with patients of other types of heart disease, those parents report that they feel a more significant negative impact on their life and more parental stress. 83% of surveyed patients showed that they had either findings consistent with acute stress or post-traumatic stress. And that number compares with 30% of all comers of congenital heart disease and 20% of parents who have children undergoing a heart transplant. The first hospital stay is typically about a month and has an average cost ranging from $340,000 to $400,000. These parents report that it's difficult for them to bond with their children when they're in the hospital and they're sick. And they've stated that the time when they received their diagnosis and the immediate aftermath is the worst time in their lives. In pediatrics, the decision-making often falls to the surrogates who are the parents. And they're generally considered the best decision-makers for their children. They have a responsibility to support the interests of the child and the family unit. And it's helpful for us to frame conversations with parents around the responsibilities towards the child rather than focusing on parental rights. It can be useful to incorporate 
cultural, social, or religious diversity into these conversations in order to respect the family's autonomy in their decision making. There are several ethics principles that we'll touch on today. The best interest standard, informed consent, informed decision making. We'll briefly talk about something called the reasonable person standard and then talk about the right to refuse. The best interest standard um, in a most simplified way is maximizing benefits and minimizing harms. It's a well accepted approach to surrogate decision making, uh, especially in the case of pediatrics where the patient cannot speak for himself or herself. From the AEP policy statement, they advise that the best interest standard should acknowledge the patient's emotional, social, and medical concerns along with the interests of the child's family in the process of medical decision making. And when we talk about harms, this might be multifactorial, so we have to consider what is acceptable. Best interest is still problematic and it's subjective because this is a values judgment. And as we know, values are deeply personal. A person may have certain views on quantity versus quality of life. They may bring a certain religious belief or cultural background to that conversation, and their education level may also affect how they process the information that you're telling them. Because we are talking about a values judgment and no clear answer exists, it's important to remember that the parents' decisions are valid, even if they're not necessarily in line with the medical team's recommendation. And again, from the AAP policy statement, it's important to have shared family-centered decision-making, which is increasingly used for pediatric medical decision-making and builds on a collaborative communication approach between families and clinicians. When we talk about informed consent, there are a lot of lay definitions, and I found these um, in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary and a legal dictionary, and they typically focus on giving consent for a procedure or a surgery or participation in an experiment, understanding what's involved, understanding the purpose, benefits, and risks of the intervention, and agreeing to participate, or agreeing to allow something to happen once you've gotten all the relevant facts. But when we talk about informed consent and informed decision making from an ethics standpoint, there are certain specific criteria that we need to consider. It's the duty of the clinician to explain the nature of the illness and the condition, to discuss the proposed diagnostic steps or treatments and the probability of their success. The decision maker, presumably the parent in this case, needs to understand the potential risks, benefits, and uncertainties of the proposed treatments and alternative treatments, which may include the option of no treatment other than comfort measures. The team needs to assess that the patient, or in this case, when the patient's a newborn, the surrogate decision maker, understands and that they have the medical decision making capacity and that they have time to ask questions if they have them. And there should be no coercion. There should be voluntary agreement from all parties with the plan. There's several barriers to making a well-informed decision when you receive a new, unexpected, serious diagnosis. There's lack of knowledge regarding the prognosis. Perhaps you can be told the immediate risk, what the survival might be through the first or second or third procedure, what's the risk of bleeding and infection. But you may not be aware, there's a possibility of cognitive and psychomotor complication down the road. There are long-term cardiac and non-cardiac risks. And there's potential effects to the family unit that can be very serious. Parents are often in a state of shock, and there's an urgency to make this decision because a treatment plan, if intervention is going to be made, has to be implemented fairly quickly. Cohn um, talks about the reasonable person standard. And he says, when we don't have enough information to have a clear-cut choice one way or another, what might a competent person do with that information? And if it's acceptable for them to make a certain choice, then that decision meets what's called a reasonable person standard. And lastly, when we talk about the right to refuse and consider a burden to benefit analysis, it's easy to make a decision 
if there's a high burden and a poor outcome, or if there's a low burden and we know things are going to go very well afterward. But when things fall in the gray zone where there is some burden and the outcomes are unclear, it becomes more difficult to make that decision. And that's where our conversation is focused on today. Ideally, clinicians and families are able to communicate all these risks and the benefits and come to a consensus decision. But let's see what the data actually shows. So this is a survey of 750 cardiologists and congenital heart surgeons across North America uh, from 2010. So it's all, um, the most recent data that's available. And almost all respondents in this survey reported that they do discuss surgery as an option um, for new diagnosis HLHS. About two-thirds of them reported that they discussed transplant. And that might vary because certain centers don't do transplant. And as we mentioned before, the availability of organs can be prohibitive. And then the fewest number reported that they discuss comfort care as an option. In those physicians who um, omitted discussing comfort care, they reported they, they believed that survival or developmental outcomes were reasonable or acceptable since they exceeded 50%. Some felt they were excellent. And some said, well, they were relatively good enough to make it unethical to offer comfort care only. And Gil Bornowski at CHOP wrote that by not intervening for HLHS, we deprive today's patient of today's results, but more tragically, we deprive them of what is to come in the future. In those physicians who opted to discuss comfort care, they stated they felt the patient should be provided with accurate outcome data to choose the best options for their child. They wanted to tailor recommendations to the specific family situation and patient condition. They felt there was no right or wrong answer. And they reported they felt the decision rests with the parents after complete informed consent. So next, the researchers asked the same group, what decision would you choose for your own hypothetical infant who had hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And 42% reported that they would still choose surgery in this situation. So how can this be? Clinicians also showed consistency over time in making this decision. So Cohn did a survey of physicians over an eight year period. And during that time, 20% of the clinicians surveyed reported they would still choose comfort care despite the advances that had happened during that time. And another 35% were uncertain between surgical intervention and comfort care. So here we have 55% of clinicians who presumably know the most about this diagnosis and the process through which people are going, who felt at least some degree of uncertainty in making this decision. This data suggests that decisions are made in a more nuanced way than just considering survival or IQ or risk of physical limitation. That those who know this process best are using other factors as well in their decision making. In parent surveys, most parents who opted for surgical intervention reported that comfort care was discussed, although in some cases only briefly, uh, or in the case of, or you could do nothing and your baby will die. Uh, some parents reported they considered comfort care and then later changed their minds. Characteristics of parents who were more likely to choose intervention were parents who were from a more recent time period or later era where there were more options and better outcomes. There are certain geographic pockets around the country, such as the southern United States, that tend to have higher incidence of parents who choose to um, intervene. Parents and families who are treated at teaching hospitals and those who um, sensed significant physician optimism. In surveys, these parents reported they perceived it was the only acceptable choice to do something, or it was the best choice, or they were taking action to fix the problem. One parent said it was a no-brainer, and other parents cited religious or spiritual belief. In the parents who chose comfort, they felt that they were preventing suffering. 
They endorsed the belief that the survival outcomes or developmental outcomes were poor, and they had a concern that the child's quality of life would be diminished. Is there cost to be an issue? I'm sorry? Is there cost to Could be the an cost issue? be an issue? I don't, I don't know the answer to that because that wasn't addressed in any of these parental surveys, and I don't know if, if most parents are aware of the cost of these hospitalizations. In these surveys, uh, the data also show that parents deliberated longer to reach decision of comfort care as compared with parents who opted to intervene, which suggests that this decision was not made lightly. Coming to the ethical considerations of this issue, we want to honor the surrogate decision-making process and collaborative communication between the family and the patient and the physician. And therefore, comfort care must be discussed. The decision on what to do in this case is deeply personal. We've talked about that it's rooted in the family's values. And the whole process is already strained due to urgency, stress, and uncertainty. By providing all options to allow informed consent, informed decision making, we're respecting the parent's choice. When we fail to discuss comfort care, we're placing a value judgment on what's the correct or best option, and that's obstructing the informed consent process. And if we say that 55% of clinicians from the data that we have, based on the current available survival outcomes, developmental information, and psychosocial implications, feel that the choice of comfort measures is reasonable, then the family should also be able to make a decision using the reasonable person standard. When there's no clear-cut answer, the decision is not necessarily the providers to make. It has to be shared. To support parental decision-making or surrogate decision-making, we need to give the information and guidance to make a well-reasoned choice. And that would allow decision-making that's consistent with the family's values and beliefs. And regardless of the decision that the family makes, it's important for us to give support during and after the decision-making process. Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll open up for some discussion and questions. Yes, Dr. Leland. Uh, Nay, and that was absolutely phenomenal and it's super educational. I can't tell you how much I have learned having the opportunity to um, work through this in some capacity with you. I was wondering if you would speak to um, the concern that many may have that in a uh, decision-making process, as you've been describing, that offering or discussing an option of comfort care may suggest to the family that the clinician has given up or doesn't believe that there is hope and if you've ever had an experience surrounding that and how you navigated it. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, as clinicians, we do have a great deal of power in how we share the information. And we are the experts. So the family is going to look to us for the ultimate recommendation most of the time um, because this is a, a diagnosis that's rare, and most people don't know anybody who has it. Um, and that's probably true across the board for other rare cardiac things, rare pediatric things. In my personal experience, I have, um, I have discussed comfort care as an option, and I cannot think of a time when a family opted to go for it. And I think that means that we are sharing the information as a choice, and after they think about it, they still feel like they can make a, an informed decision based on the information that's provided to them. Did you have a comment, Dr. Hoyer? No, I, um, man, that was great. Thanks so much for uh, rounding that out, that out for us today. Um, a couple of comments, and I just made a few notes about some of the interesting things. Um, you took the words out of my mouth as far as the power that we have to shape a discussion. and. Um, and sometimes insert our own biases. Sure. As a funny aside, when I was a fellow, I was accused by my faculty uh, in, a, in a glib fashion of just being too good at talking people into doing nothing. <laughs> now, 
granted, I'm 100 years old, so, you know, that was back in a time where, where the Norwood operation wasn't such a great option or, or wasn't quite as successful and quite as uh, tried and, and, and done as at, in many places. But be that as it may, you know, and, and again, how much time do you spend talking about that? You know, do you spend more time rather than just say, well, the, you know, we, option three is we can do nothing and your baby will die. If, if, right. if that were the way you said that, uh, that would be right. difficult. Not to mention the fact that whether it's hypoplastic left heart syndrome or even other kinds of uh, uh, things that might be m complicated, the knee jerk response for most people is do everything you can, doc. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you sometimes have to kind of come in with that idea in mind that that's where they're going to be coming from you know, to, to some degree or not. Um, one other thing, or two other things real quickly, the cost, somebody mentioned cost. Um, it hasn't been too often, but I had an Amish family that uh, had a, a child with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And obviously, you know, they, they, they have common folk insurance, which means that basically the community pays for the child. And so that could be a big issue as well, particularly if you're talking about staged operations. In this particular case, that are guaranteed. If you're talking about going the three-stage palliative approach, that's a guarantee. So that's a lot of money. You're not going to, it's not a one and done. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, all of the, it, I've used the term many times, I think, when I've talked with our folks is that, you know, your child is born today, and, you know, this is what we did last, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. You will ride the waves of technology. You know, your child will rise the way, as in 20 years, things may be different. However, it's going to be hard to do much with a very small left ventricle unless we ultimately do 3D printing of biologic tissue or so, which, you know, is pie in the sky, but it's things that are being talked about. So anyway, I mean, I think that's, that's, that what, that's what makes this one a tough one, and, and I think I would still offer it, you know, after discussing everything. And, and, and anyway, it's a little bit of my experience. Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Raynal had a question in the back. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Shravastava, for being here today. Um, my question for you is um, for the provider who, after hearing your lecture, uh, reflects upon their own experience and attitudes and beliefs, realizes that they're either not comfortable counseling families on a palliative approach or in similar clinical cases of counseling on palliative care options, or realizes that they don't have enough knowledge on how to do that. What advice or what resources would you offer um, physicians to strengthen their skills at offering and providing this as an option? Mm -hmm. So um, some of the ethics literature touches on your question. And the, the literature says, you know, if you are uncomfortable or it doesn't align with your beliefs, it's still your obligation to find somebody who can have these conversations with the patients because it's important. So in an immediate setting, options might include talking to palliative care, to the ethics service, or to somebody from cardiology or neonatology who might be able to give some insight. In a long-term sense, working towards having these conversations, I think it's, it's an issue of um, practicing and um, you know, participating in conversations that are of a delicate nature because I think there's no way to learn it without watching people who are skilled at doing what they do do it, and then having the opportunities to have those thoughtful and meaningful interactions with patients. Thanks, Diane, that was great. Um, can you maybe comment on if you found in your research how prenatal diagnosis of these things has affected or maybe made it easier or harder to have these conversations? Sure. So um, prenatal diagnosis gives the opportunity for a little bit more time in many cases on contemplating what course of action a family might want to do. However, depending on the timing of the prenatal diagnosis, in some cases, termination of pregnancy is also an option. And um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we'll talk about here today. Um, but um, in the overall statistics for what people choose to do with a prenatal diagnosis, it does seem to be that there is more, um, more families who opt for comfort care in that case than um, for intervention after the baby's born. 
And it's unclear to me if it's um, due to more time to reflect on it or that the baby hasn't arrived and in some ways is kind of an abstract um, decision rather than um, you have the child in front of you um, or what those factors are exactly. But it does seem to be that in general, there's a slight preference in um, choosing comfort in that case rather than intervention. I wonder if there's any dramatic extremes of what clinicians in a given institution do on one side or the other. Uh, back in the days with, you know, severe premature babies, there were some neonatal groups that would argue you could never let a 1,000 gram, then 750 gram, then 600 gram, and a 500 gram baby die without intervention. And yet there were others who were just the opposite. Right. And I wonder if you or any of the cardiologists from talking to their colleagues know whether there are places, because you know, each place is up to frequently, it's a few individual doctors that kind of make the decisions. There are you know, some that are big places like this where you have a whole bunch of people arguing and talking and discussing. But do you know, are there places that you know, you're familiar with where you know, uh, they, they never, op never offer comfort care or just the opposite? They strongly push for comfort care. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I can't speak to that um, specifically, but maybe somebody else in the audience might know the answer to that. I would imagine that there are such places, but yeah, yeah. And, and people maybe know in those circles that, oh, if such and such person is on, we're, this is what we're gonna be doing, you know? Uh, I'm Ryan, I'm one of the cardiology fellows. I worked with Nane when she was a, <clears throat> a third year. Um, I, to that point, um, I think it was an important distinction within, eight, within hypoplastic left heart syndrome and that not all babies are the same even within right. that severe heart spectrum. So there are, there are I think there are small, small populations within that disease process where the thought process is kind of leaning more towards comfort care. One example would be those who have a restrictive atrial septum mm -hmm. and bad lung disease. That is still a, it's a debate, but that within HLHS, it's exactly. not cut and dry. And you might find within an institution that um, certain populations within that are people lean more towards comfort care versus pushing towards surgery. So. Right, and you're absolutely right that, um, you know, some of the numbers that we talked about today and the mortality data, that's an average. Um, but, you know, I mentioned that one of the centers reported that in their most extreme group of patients, um, that their survival data was only 26% in that group, but their overall data was still pretty good because the other children were, um, were able to get through that operation. Yeah. <clears throat> is heart transplant still, an, still a possibility in these patients, uh, despite the, the fact that the anatomy has been perturbed so much? Yes, that is, um, that is an option, less so in the neonate, but it's still um, an option for certain patients. And then going from stage one to stage two to stage three is also dependent on the child meeting certain hemodynamic criteria and there's some other considerations. And so at any point, it's not necessarily guaranteed that just because you got through stage one, you would necessarily be able to get to stage two. Um, and so in those patients, it's possible that at any time they may have to leave the planned or anticipated pathway of a surgical repair and, uh, and go more towards a transplant pathway. You can, you can certainly bet that at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, when Bill Norwood was there that developed this surgery that bears his name, that they were not offering comfort care. I mean, you can bet on that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I mean, if that was the case, it might have been the lone ranger that was on the service that might have actually kind of hinted towards it. But I think at the time, you know, and that may have changed. I don't know how that would be now, but I think that's what it was then. I was telling Mark on the way uh, down here uh, on the steps that I was at a conference, oh, I'm guessing in the early 80s maybe, it was a neonatal cardiac conference, uh, 
and uh, I believe it was it was either a cardiologist or a pediatric heart surgeon from the University of Michigan, where they were maybe a few years ahead of in doing the Norwood. And they, this particular person, made it very clear. He said it. He didn't think, but he knew it was unethical to not do surgery uh, on a baby with hypoplastic. I mean, it was absolutely definitive. And again, this was 20, 25 years ago. I just want to share that it's 2018, and there are also people who know that the Earth is flat. So, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I wondered if you could speak to um, the the division here at Riley's practice about an informed consent process as the stages move forward. Is it uh, is there a discussion prior to the first stage about all three stages, or is there a revisit revisiting of where the patient is, how they have responded to each stage, likelihood of um, success or uh, more or fewer complications in progressive stages based on where they are um, and how they've responded to surgery at that point? Yeah, I think that the, the discussion about pursuing a surgical intervention a, um, pathway in hypoplastic left heart is um, contingent on discussing the big picture. And so I think that conversation happens by framing it as this is a multi-step process and we're going to really go into detail about the first of these steps right now because that's the most relevant from a timely timeliness standpoint. But what we're talking about is setting you up for these staged repairs. And along that pathway, there may be unexpected complications. And I don't know, maybe it depends on the clinician to what degree people go into what those unexpected complications could potentially be. And I think that in discussing that pathway in general, um, most of the doctors here are mindful in saying, here are at least some of the big complications that we might anticipate down the road and things that we may be addressing 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, assuming that we get through this first part. Um, and so I think that that discussion happens up front, and then I think it's certainly revisited at each um, decision-making branch point um, or before each potential intervention that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Larry Markham with Cardiology. Um, I guess I would like to hear you comment a little bit about truly informed consent um, and you know um, a lot of our patients don't have a medical background may not have even graduated from high school and we're asking them to absorb the information that you gave us um, a little bit of my background I'm a, a cardiologist, as I said, my wife's a neonatologist, and last summer our son had a, an exceedingly minor surgical procedure. And so I, as a provider, was signing informed consent that said all the same things that a patient undergoing a Norwood said, bleeding, infection, right. <laughs> risk of death, and stroke, and kidney failure, and all that same stuff. And I knew none of that was going to happen to my son for this minor procedure, but could you comment on that? Because it doesn't just affect cardiology, it affects every specialty and every right. proceduralist yeah. of how we truly determine that we have obtained informed consent. Yeah, I think that the the true answer to that question is very difficult because it's subjective and it relies on, you know, us kind of, we talked about the, the factors of that conversation that need to happen, but, you know, ultimately you're kind of going with your gut that did you convey the right information and do they seem to understand the right information? And I don't think there's a way to prove that and say, yes, you took the right take-home points away from this discussion. And I think that the only way is, you know, by giving as much time as possible when available to be sure that any questions that they have are answered and, and getting as best assessment as you can that they have understood the information that you're trying to tell them. And in my experience, 
I've gone through the heart diagram with the family day after day after day, before, you know, and it's been multiple times before they like say, yeah, okay, I think I finally am in understanding what we're talking about. And, and each family is going to be different, which makes it all the more difficult to do. Yeah, maybe it's a short comment to that. Roger Horowitz, who just retired a year or two ago, when I was a fellow, he'd always say, unless the family cries, they haven't gotten the message. And there's probably a lot of truth in that. So, you know, it's easy to sugarcoat everything. It's much easier for the provider as well to sugarcoat and, well, there are things we can do and if everything goes well, you know, but, you know, statistics and medicine don't mean a whole lot if you're the one where things don't go well. Right. You know, that's why you have to for a minor procedure, the risk of death, because it can happen. You know, we drive to work every day and something bad can happen. It usually doesn't. You know, we don't get consent for our families who travel for a clinic appointment. They could get in a bad car accident on the way down here and we don't mm -hmm. consent for that. So it's always hard to say which point, how much do you emphasize all those risks or not. But yeah. so I think you've got a good point across. If the family cries, you know, they have understood some, what you're trying to tell them, how severe it is. And then, right. You have to can back, you know, back down and kind of come back to the second point and then see where what actually decision points are. But it's it's definitely hard to to know what they really understood. Hello. Um, did you see any papers that looked at maybe surveying families who had had a kid? who have gone through their procedures and um, ask the family, the parents, what in retrospect, what they're under, did they, do they feel now that they've gone through it, did they have a good understanding of what it actually meant to have a child and raise a child with HLHS and if they could do it again, mm -hmm. would they? It'd be an interesting question. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's ever looked at it, but I feel like not just we focus on mortality, but the morbidity, and you, you mentioned quality of life for the, for the, for the kid, um, being perceived as less, but the quality of life for the family, I think, is also something that may not be discussed very um, or understood very well, what it actually means, especially in that first six months of life, to take care of a kid with a Norwood. Yeah. Um, there are some um, studies that look at that very question. And, um, you know, as you can imagine, the responses are varied. And there are people who say, wow, I really had no idea what I was getting into. And I, um, I thought that uh, this was going to be a little bit smoother than it ended up being. And then there's other people who say, I had a great cardiologist who sat down and went through the diagrams and I felt very informed. And then we were kind of ready when things didn't go well um, with, you know, we, we had anticipated that there would be bumps on the road. So I think that the data on that is, is mixed and that's probably no surprise. Uh, that people are going to take away different um, perceptions from those conversations and, you know, bring their own beliefs and their own expectations to that, then the outcomes are going to, you know, they'll perceive them based on a variety of factors. Any final questions or we'll wrap up a little early? <laughs> uh, Nancy, yeah. I'm not quite sure what I want to say right now because um, I grew up with um, knowing that I would have had an older brother, mm -hmm. but he was born with hyperplastic left syndrome. Yeah. Hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And that was in 1962. And the only you know, option my parents had were comfort care. And that was a year before I was born, so I never got to know him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of dictated my life, being an echo tech, you know, that, that's, I feel like I'm doing it for a good reason. And um, this talk has had a profound effect on me today, and I'm not real sure why. Because, you know, I tell people, I do this now, and I'm, you know, totally, my heart is totally into this because we can fix these things and we can fix it. But, you know, we can, we can, we can allow yeah. people to get to know their child mm -hmm. and to get to know their brother and sister. And, you know, even if it's for a short time, because my parents thought they had a healthy baby. Mm 
-hmm. And they were getting ready to walk out the door with him when he started, you know, when the PDA started closing. And they, they were actually across the street from Cincinnati Children's. So they were where they should be. You know, and, and they said, you know, we, we don't know exactly what this is, but he's got maybe a 30 percent chance of survival. And, you know, and so I think when you're offered when comfort care is the only thing you do have, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's one thing. But um, there's never been a day in my life I didn't wish I that they could have done something for him so I could have gotten to know him. So that's just this side of it. Yeah, I, I think that's a really valuable perspective that um, we have options now. And I think that's a, a value-based decision for each family. Well, and I know what my parents went through my, my whole life. Yeah. I mean, they still, every year on his birthday, it's still a, a thing. Right. You know, that they, that they had to live with. And so, yeah, this is, this is good. This is a good discussion.